and it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. Welcome to Podcast UFO for our live show. We're live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Please remember to visit the website podcastufo.com for past episodes, blogs, and forums. During the show, feel free to participate live in our chat room. And don't forget to like us on our very active Facebook page. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host, and we have a great show tonight with guest Jeremy Corbell, and he's an investigative filmmaker. Well, before that, we have Alejandro Rojas, and he's going to be there with the latest UFO news coming up. And if you're listening live, please head over to podcastufo.com and sign into our easy sign-in chat room. Again, I want, always want to thank supporters for just as little as a dollar a month. You can help support us. And if you're not able to, we still appreciate each and every one of you regardless. A little shout out to a couple of people that helped, like Alan S. or Bill E., Bruce F., James R., Bobby Hernandez. I'm saying his whole name because he hung out with me in North Carolina, so I feel like I can say his full name. We have a Aaron... B. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And we're going to quickly draw for a $10 supporter a month or more t-shirt. Hang on. We have Kathy M. She wins. All right. Well, that's enough of my shenanigans. It's time to bring on the one and the only Alejandro Ufologist Rojas. Oompa Loompa. I was getting you back for on your show. Adding the middle name. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, that's that's a custom on my show to add the middle name. So it sounds like you're adopting that. You also did um, a bit of, which we did on our show a lot, of the kind of a Seinfeld hello at the beginning. Oh, I did. Hello. Well, that's almost like uh, Mrs. Doubtfire hello. That's oh, where, yeah, that's right. Where that was hello. Yeah. But, but I, don't, I guess if our show's start to get uh, very similar. I don't think people are going to mind because uh, they'll get the shows twice. That's right. Well, you know, I had, I've had i only had one kind of complaint about that, and really it is we, are, we always have to watch our guests because sometimes our guests can almost overlap, and mm-hmm. I don't think we ever do that on purpose. You know, Mm-mm. it just happens. So, In fact, there's times where I'll try to be sure that, you know, it's someone different. You know what? I've uh, started listening to your show, and I'm finding it quite enjoyable. Really? Yeah, I'm almost thinking about just giving up this show and just listening to your show. Uh, okay. No. Now nah, people like to have that. both of them going. That's right. No. A lot of times that uh, there are times where, you know, go, go to shows or something, and people will be like, oh, yeah, I heard you on Martin's show. And I have had some feedback. I usually don't pay attention much to feedback, uh, mostly because I'm too busy writing stories and everything. But there were a few people that were, of course, sad that Jason was gone uh, from our show, but uh, happy that you're going to be joining me on a weekly basis. So that's cool. Yeah, I bet a lot of people, um, you know, really will miss Jason. I listened to a number of shows in the past, and he was good. He did a good job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He's a funny little feller. Yeah, he is. He is funny. All right. So what do we have going on for news this week? All right, well, we have a sighting that was posted by Roger Marsh, another MUFON sighting on the site. And he uh, says that this was seen on May 25th at about 10.30 p.m. Uh, It was seen over the I-75 highway in Michigan near Hazel Park. And uh, this witness says they saw uh, something that... uh, was oblong horizontally, uh, they say, and and the edges uh, had pieces that appeared to be sticking out from it. So the object they they felt was kind of strange looking, even though it was mostly kind of an orangish-reddish light that was uh, an orange light flying through the sky. The person said, 
First, they thought maybe that it was a Chinese lantern, but then they changed their mind for a couple of reasons. Those reasons being, let me scroll down here to read these, is that, first of all, it was too large, they said, to be a Chinese lantern. Also, that it moved too far or and fast, um, and that it didn't have smooth, round edges. So the person estimated that the object was 300 feet away. That's pretty close. Right. Uh, they did get a video from their cell phone, and it doesn't appear to be a very close object. In fact, unfortunately, on the video, all you can see is this small point of light off in the distance, so you can't really make much out of it. But uh, an interesting sighting. Now, when they say this thing had weird, like, structure or edges or something like that, did if the video didn't come out very good, did they draw a picture of it? Are you aware of that? Uh, it did not come along with the MUFON report. So they didn't draw and submit a sighting. See, now, this is one of the things. Roger Marsh, when he posts his stories typically, he is posting them when they're posted onto the MUFON website uh, so that we could get, you know, quickly some of the sightings that are out there. Now, what will happen, and it's, it can take a long time, is that a MUFON investigator will contact the witness, um, and then uh, perhaps if they feel it's warranted, then they'll meet with the witness and perhaps get some drawings and things like that. Then they'll write up a report and submit it. That could take a month, to. Uh, a long period of time. They like the the reports to be completed within 90 days. So it can take some time. And then once they're submitted, uh, you know, then Roger never knows when they're submitted. So sometimes he'll have to go back and look to see what uh, reports were finished up and uh, what the results were. So it takes some time to get that sort of thing. So Perhaps in the future, if uh, this uh, after investigation proves to be uh, remain an unknown object, uh, he'll get some drawings or something like that. But uh, thus far, there are no drawings that were included. Yeah, I'm always interested in the different shaped craft when something you know is unusual compared to what you usually hear. They look like. And yeah, this, for this sure. Like one of those. And it can be hard, though, I mean, uh, because your eyes, especially at night also, you know, everybody sees this, the kind of the starlight effect where, you know, it seems to uh, not be a point of light when it actually is. So um, sometimes uh, those can be illusions. Right, right. So what else is happening? What's happening? Well, this is kind of interesting. Skrillex, you heard of this dude? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, he's got uh, this uh, kind of wild haircut, and uh, I first heard about Skrillex from Travis Walton, because Travis Walton said he went to this guy's birthday party uh, in Malibu, and that there were lots of stars there, so I was like, what the heck, who is this guy? Turns out he's an electronic dance music uh, guy who's really into UFOs and aliens and stuff, and uh, supposedly, I guess he had a dream at least that he believes uh, might be really related to alien contact or there are aliens in this dream, and somehow he got this idea from this dream to share images of the Earth from satellites. Uh, maybe it was from. Maybe he was in a UFO flying around, and he looked mm -hmm. out the window and said, "Hey, that looks cool. There so should be actually, some wallpaper like that." So he actually came up with this idea from a dream. Yeah, from a dream about aliens. Somehow he doesn't go into detail, but uh, this is information that was written on a uh, website called PSFK that keeps up on technology, and it's based off of uh, something that Google just released that uh, they worked with Skrillex with. Google released some um, Android phone cases, and with the phone cases, you get this wallpaper, and this wallpaper beams to your phone live images from satellite. So pretty cool. I mean, I'm, that's a good idea for wallpaper, I think. Oh, it's uh, awesome. It also comes with an app where you get Skrillex music, you get the album before it comes out, all of this cool Skrillex stuff if you're into it. Skrillex is really into aliens, like I said, so he has lots of alien imagery in his artwork. So uh, it's kind of cool. And, yeah, he uh, Travis said that uh, at the last... Uh, birthday party he had that uh, Giorgio Sukulos was there. Let's see who else. Um, Corey Feldman. Oh yeah. Craig Craig Robinson. I don't know who that is. Tony Hawk. He's a skateboarder guy. Mm -hmm. Ryan Cabrera. I'm not sure who that is. Gary Busey. Everybody oh, knows boy. who Gary Busey is. Yeah, he's nuts as can be. I love the guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Tara Reed. Oh yeah, 
from uh, American Famous Pie. Famous for, I that. think, yeah. Sharknado. Oh, is that right? Now, I think she's in Sharknado. You know, Skrillex, that seems a, that's a real good alien name if you think about it. It is. That's a really good point. And maybe, I don't know where the name derives from, maybe from the alien dream. Could be. But, you know, I mean, how do we know, you know, with the haircut and everything, how do we know he's not an alien? It's entirely possible. It, I think that it uh, probable. In fact, if we ask the Roswell Slides people, I'm sure they'll be able to find some goofball scientist who will be able to claim that Skrillex is an alien. As long as they can do it from a photo. <laughs> yeah. If we send them a photo of Skrillex. Zing. They, yeah. yeah. All right. So what's the last story today? <laughs> the last story has to do with your girlfriend. Oh. She um, is an alien. I sent a picture to the Roswell people. and No, actually, it does because, and I know this because you told me about this on my show, but uh, it has to do with a Russian UFO video. So the UK media, media picked up on this Russian UFO video, and, you know, they post it uh, without doing research because they're really terrible at doing investigative uh, journalism, and they... Assume that this video was recent because it did go up on YouTube and said Russian UFO 2015. But if they would have done a little bit of research, they would have found that this video actually comes from 2013. And uh, furthermore, that the UFOs in this video were also seen over St. Petersburg in 2012. And there's some other videos posted there as well. So although the video isn't from 2015, it's a very interesting video. It does show these lights, uh, these these uh, points of light, and it's not quite dark out. It's kind of like twilight, and they're kind of in a cluster floating up there in the air um, in all of these videos, and so you could see those in our story. Um, so it's kind of weird. There's people who are adamant that these are flares. Some people have suggested Chinese lanterns. Um, I'm kind of thinking I could see how they might be flares, but you made some arguments as how uh, to why... They might not be. Yeah, well, first of all, um, I, there's no way they're Chinese lanterns because they're just way too right. bright. They're super Agreed. bright. Um, and then <clears throat> the other argument I made is that, uh, well, one I didn't think of at the time is uh, why uh, were they staying so still? There's absolutely no fall in them. Uh, do, do new type of, of technology flares uh, stay in one place or do they actually float toward the ground? Well, here's the thing, and I've got video that I posted with this story that I've taken of flares uh, because I used to see flares a lot here by my home in the Goldwater Range, uh, the same area where the flares were supposedly dropped at 10 p.m. Uh, the night of the Phoenix Lights uh, for some reason. But um, uh, they do, when they're really far off like these are, like Goldwater is like 60, 80 miles away from me. And surprisingly, you see these things just like in this video, super bright. But they're so far away, and I guess they're on parachutes. You don't see flame. You don't see smoke. Uh, you don't see parachutes. And they don't uh, seem to be dropping at all. They seem to be just still there in the air. So I think they drop at such a low rate that uh, they don't appear to be dropping at all unless you have some sort of reference point, something uh, on the ground next to them, which often you don't when they're in the air. So, um, yeah, they can look like they're standing still. Okay. Well, they're most likely flares. I, I, I have to admit that. You know, it was kind of puzzling to me. A couple things are puzzling. One is, uh, yes, the ones in St. Petersburg look exactly like them, and would they actually drop flares over St. Petersburg? That's another question. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, these were like almost daylight or early twilight. And um, and that just was kind of puzzling. You didn't see any plane. They did go out around three quarters of the way through. And then um, there was another sighting over to the left. He's actually, one of them is yelling in Russian, look to the left. And you could barely see some over there. And then the ones to the right, come back exactly in the same place, and they appear to be in exactly the same cluster after they went out. So it's to me, it's kind of puzzling. Maybe it is just flares, but uh, if so, you know, there was just a couple of those questions I had. Yeah, I was feeling pretty confident that there were flares um, early on because I've seen them in clusters like this before. 
but uh, you certainly gave me uh, some things to think about. Like when you mentioned, you know, your your girlfriend translated the video and was able to uh, cure those things, but also that it's twilight. And that is very strange because it seems that flares aren't going to be very effective at twilight um, to light up the ground. So I don't know why they would be doing that unless maybe they're just practicing uh, the dropping of them and, and not using them to light the ground. So um, I don't know. They are kind of weird. People should definitely take a look at the videos. Uh, I think they're pretty striking. And uh, it's interesting that they should be happening in these populated areas. That's right. Yeah, I do suggest to take a look at the video because it is intriguing, and you can find that in our show notes on Podcast UFO, which will link over to openminds.tv. Well, I guess that'll do it, and uh, thanks a lot, Alejandro. My pleasure. And we'll be talking to you twice next week again. And hang in, everyone. We're going to be right back after the music break with Jeremy Corbell. Jeremy Corbell, how are you? I'm good, Martin. How are you doing? Good. I always worry that someone's going to forget to turn off their mute. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us. Oh, um, thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I was uh, I was excited to meet you out in Phoenix uh, back yeah. in February. I watched a, a film you did, and I thought you did an excellent job on it in many ways. It's very artistically. Um, filmed and everything about it. So I, I thought you did a really good job, and I'm excited to see what else um, you do as time goes on. Why don't you fill in the listening audience of actually who you are, and but more and not more importantly, but just as importantly, as what intrigued you in the beginning of uh, this subject? Yeah, okay. Well, that's a pretty easy question to answer. So basically, I am Jeremy Corbell. Um, I started into this field probably the, the, the same way anybody starts, just out of sheer curiosity. Uh, specifically, the moment I remember is I was 13 years old, and somehow I heard on the radio uh, the voice of Bob Lazar, John Lear, Gene Huff, and George Knapp. Um, and that was an amazing moment because that was back in 1989 when Bob Lazar was coming forward and telling his story. And at that time, the way he described the propulsion system, it was so counterintuitive to what we know of traditional or classic propulsion systems that it literally, I mean, I like to say it weaponized my curiosity. It did. It made me want to know more. It expanded my imagination and allowed me to kind of look into this because in a way it just made sense. If things are traversing or objects are traversing space time, uh, gravity amplification or the warping of gravity seems like the logical way in which that would be happening. So um, even as a young kid, this is how it all started for me, was just simply hearing a story. I mean, I didn't have a sighting or something powerful like that. I wish I had, but I hadn't. Um, but more than anything, it was just the way that the propulsion system was described that was absolutely fascinating. So that's how I started. Um, that is not the path that I took for the majority of my life. This is a more recent um, endeavor for me where I've dedicated you know, my livelihood, my life, and uh, all of my time to this for the last six years. 
So six years. And so you were, you were fairly young in 1989 when you – and did you actually hear that show live? I don't remember how I heard the show specifically, um, but I just remember hearing it. And I remember being about 13 years old. And um, – it was something that I remember affected me. I mean, it was really, you know, you go around running around telling your friends, oh, my gosh, I finally heard something that makes sense. I think there's probably E.T. life visiting the planet. And people are like, you know, back at that time, people are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Nowadays, you know, everybody's hip with the exoplanets in the Goldilocks zone. I mean, the skeptics are pretending like they made it up themselves. It's, it's, it's absolutely incredible. The paradigm has shifted within human consciousness to the point where what we were laughing about, you know, 20 years ago is commonly accepted by the majority of people on the planet today. Uh, it makes you wonder what the second question that will be answered in 20 years is. You know, I have theories, but, um, yeah, it's a different world now. You know, it's uh, a lot of times uh, when the subject comes up, and it did recently – um, when I was talking to an executive um, about a whole different matter, I said I had to do a show. He said, what show? And I said, well, it's on UFOs. And he looks at me and he said, you believe in those things? And I said, well, I don't know if belief in them. I said, something is going on. I just don't know what it is. And I don't think anyone really knows 100% sure what it is, you know, that type of thing. But I, I like that when a lot of people say you believe in like it already. It's like connotation that they're gonna, you know, it's a bad thing. <laughs> right. It, it, it's actually that's it's it's amazing. That's that's why I've uh, I, I've I've called my you know my investigative series extraordinary beliefs. It was essentially to kind of reel people in, saying, okay, if you want to call it a belief, then we'll call it an extraordinary belief. I no longer have the luxury of disbelief, but the point is it's a ruse because it's either true or it's not true. This has nothing to do with belief. There is either craft that is, that, that, that's visiting Earth from another intelligence from somewhere other than Earth itself, or it's not true. It's one or the other. You know, it, it's not a matter of belief. It, it, it's fact or it's fiction. All of the evidence is 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 extremely weighty that it that it is fact. I mean, you know, you mm -hmm. talk to anybody who who's had access to military programs. I mean, current active military individuals at the highest ranking levels that I've ever had contact with have told me deadpan, straightforward, not for me to share specifics with anybody else, but have told me, yes, we are being engaged. And we track these on a daily basis with a multitude of different types of radar. And it's just a fact. Our airspace is being, you know, traversed from vehicles of highly advanced origin that are non-terrestrial and non-human. And if that's true, I mean, I'm as, curi <laughs> I'm as curious as you. I want to know more, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, you wonder, I, I just think a lot of times, you know, in my lifetime, I would love to know, uh, actually, the answer, if there is an answer. And one of the things I've said a number of times, and I kind of repeat myself a little bit here and there, but um, it might be something that we haven't even thought of yet, you know, this oh, whole thing. absolutely. I, I am with you on that 100%. The, the deeper I go into this, the, the more I realize that this cosmic game or whatever it is that's going on, it is not as simple as we make it. It, 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 it cannot simply be, uh, you know, craft from other intelligences that live in other solar systems within the Milky Way galaxy or beyond. I mean, it just cannot. It's too bizarre. It's too strange. It's unfathomable. So I, I'm with you. I, you know, I'm kind of like go old school Jacques Vallée style. There is something else going on. Most likely, it, it, it seems that there is a um, – I don't even know if I call it an education program like, like Valet would say, but it's some sort of um, – it appears to me that whatever's going on is far beyond vehicles coming from other star systems. That's all I'm comfortable saying because I'm as lost mm -hmm. as you. Yeah. Yeah. Now let's talk quickly about your website. We'll bring that up a few times, but sure. um, I actually like the name of it, extraordinarybeliefs.com. 
Yeah. And on that website, one of the favorite spots I found um, today was um, your favorite UFO quotes. Because a oh, lot of yeah. a lot of them I had never heard before or seen before, and interesting quotes, and they date all the way back, you know, to the forties. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, there's uh, presidents. There's uh, how long did it take you to compile that list? It's a great list. Uh, thanks, man. Um, you know what? That was just over a long time, and you know, I've tried to kind of validate. There's so many quotes on there that I had that were amazing, but I just I could not trace them back. So I would say, you know, the majority of what you find there, I've been able to kind of uh, validate in some way. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, I reserve the right to to take any out of there, but the majority. You know, I did work on them. I didn't just like copy and paste from the internet. You know, I would find quotes, try to find the origins of them. So I can stand behind most of them, but I'm I'm willing to be wrong. But the, yeah, I, what, what was your favorite quote? I, um, let's see, it's one I've heard before, and oh, uh, the twining the twining memo. I always thought that first was a really one, good one. Right? Is that the first one? Uh, yeah. the, the UFO phenomenon being yeah. reported is something real and yeah. not visionary or fictitious. That's General Nathan Twining, um, and that was from a mer- memorandum, uh, you know, that uh, – yeah, I mean, so, th- so that one I actually have a date for. I, I, I feel like that is a real quote, <laughs> but uh, a yeah. lot of these are pretty – you know, do your research, pl- and please, audience listening, tell me if I missed a good one <laughs> or if one of them is not right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, then the flying saucer situation is not at all imaginary. Um, you know, night, that was all the way back in 1847. Well, I mean, look, th- this this phenomenon that we call the UFO phenomenon, which I think is a really, like, narrow way to look at it, but, but this experience that we're having as humans where there appears to be other intelligences communicating with humanity – I mean, it dates back to the beginning of recorded human history. I mean, we all know that. We've all been exposed to ancient alien theories and all of this. I mean, even, you know, Christopher Columbus has documented in his journals, you know, USOs, which are not talked about, but were some of the first sightings ever recorded. So, I mean, most of the planet is water, and if these things usually and actually use um, gravitational propulsion systems, then it wouldn't matter if they were traversing water or air or up in outer space. It would be the same to them because they're creating an artificial field. So if any of this is true, you know, the place I would hide is, you know, where most of the planet is, which is water. So USOs, because it's hard to study, is one of the most interesting, uh, you know, parts of this phenomenon. Yes. Um, recently, I was looking for a guest. Actually, I haven't had anyone really talk on that subject. I know there are a few people out there, but I oh, am yeah. looking to get a guest on the show that will talk exclusively about that. My, that is my, fascinating. Yeah, my my mentor George Knapp, and you know, I, with a lot of gratitude, I'm able to call him my mentor. You know, he has helped me incredibly, as he likes to say, separating you know the wheat from the chaff and trying to figure out what the the pitfalls are, how to, you know, vet in individuals and information. I mean, he's straight up called Nellis Air Force Base, uh, you know, to help, you know, figure something out for me. I mean, th- this guy's amazing. So I model my, my, my investigations after him, and, you know, one day I hope that I'm half as good as him. But, um, you know, essentially... Uh, yeah, th- he had somebody on about USOs on Coast to Coast uh, the other night, and it was fascinating. I mean, the guy wrote a whole book on USOs. Oh, I'm going to have to check out who that is. <laughs> but if oh, he was yeah, just yeah. on, you know, it probably wouldn't work. But anyway, I uh, I agree about George Knapp. I think he's top shelf. Um, oh, beyond. Really, yeah. uh, I really respect him, highly respect him. He has almost been on the show like 10 times now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's like, it's, you know, he's a he's busy the guy. Busiest, he's the busiest man on the planet. I mean, I don't know this guy. I mean, I've seen him in action. You know, he is the busiest man on the planet. But, you know, the thing about George Knapp is that he has the absolute 100 percent. I mean, look, we're talking about a two time Peabody award winning 24 Emmy uh, journalist, you know, for, for excellence in journalism, and, and those stories were were not about UFOs. I mean, maybe mm-hmm. maybe one of them was, but um, the point is, he is an incredible investigative journalist 
to begin with. And the fact that he will openly and honestly investigate uh, all of these you know, phenomena and report on them. I mean, I don't know if you can, you can cuss on your show, but he's got, you know, he's a strong dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so we're getting, since we're talking about George Knapp, um, I watched your film um, last night, Lazar, on your, on your website. I rented Great. it and watched it. And um, I, and, and I also read your blog on um, the, uh, I don't know if it was a confrontation or at the conference. I missed it anyway. I had to come back early. Um, I, I guess it was the night. It wasn't a, a debate. It was like a uh, panel discussion. And, oh, okay. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, um, Bob Lazar has been one of those uh, cases that, and I like. I just told you how I felt about George Knapp, and I know George Knapp basically um, stands behind the Lazar story. But there's a lot of questions when well, it comes to he, he stands behind what he's reported on. If, yeah, of course, there's a lot of questions. Um, let, let's take a step back for a second. Okay. Not to cut you off, just let's let's start from the beginning. Sure. Um, first of all, th- there's no confrontation. There, there there is a legitimate debate that is going on right now about the Lazar story, which there should be a healthy debate. That debate, I guess, is between Stanton Friedman and myself. I feel that over the last 25 years that Stanton has decided to ignore evidence that has been brought forward because it suits his engineered ideas. Now, this is not bad-mouthing Stanton. This is just simply... My perspective, I think that there's more to the story than is being accepted and being propagated. Just because Stanton goes out there and is unopposed doesn't make him right. You know, he's not judge, jury, and executioner for all things Lazar. He's a guy that spent a little time looking at it. But as we know, George Knapp has spent 25 years relentlessly digging up the story. If you spend the smallest amount of time looking at the actual words that Bob Lazar has said and trying to understand what he truly conveyed, then you, you may have a different opinion on, on, on just all, you know, all of a sudden shutting out the idea that he's telling you the truth. Um, I, I find there's more misconceptions about the Lazar story than any other UFO story on the planet. So, Mm-hmm. Just just to get to the basics of it, yeah. Rendlesham Forest, I think, is one of them that's not too far away from from that either. Just oh, that yeah. there's a lot of controversy in that. Um, so one of the the one of the things that I thought um, was very um, uh, condemning, I guess I would say, and but I I can't I can't find any information on it. I heard it somewhere at one time, so it's not you know good evidence. But what I had heard was that. Bob was being interviewed, and someone said to him, "Well, Bob, I went to MIT. What is the what is the square right outside of MIT?" And everyone knows it's Kenmore Square, and Bob Lazar did not know. Um, and if you went to MIT, you step out of the door, and there's Kenmore Square right there. So that's the only thing that I I mean that's one of the things I've heard. That I think, huh? How could he yeah. possibly have gone there? In okay, not so that? so I I've never heard that story, and again, it's like second hand, third hand, like right. you know. Here here's the deal: on stage at the International UFO Congress 2015. I mean, I I went up on stage. I had no idea what they wanted me to talk about up there. <laughs> Whistleblowers. I was like, okay, let's talk. Sitting next to to Stan, you know, who I respect greatly. You know, he's a nice dude. And all of a sudden, I realized, oh, okay, this is what they want me to talk about, right? And so the the thing is, I pulled out of Stan for the first time ever. He's been saying for 25 years that Bob Lazar cannot answer the most fundamental scientific or physics-based questions. And I thought that was unbelievably misleading because, I mean, Bob has has written – the, the most incredible scientific emails to me, you know, basically, you know, debunking some of my stuff, you know. So it, it's amazing to me that someone would say that. So I, I kind of asked Stan, like, have you ever had an in-depth conversation, you know, with Bob Lazar? The answer was no. Stan Freeman has never met Bob Lazar. 
He's never met him. He mm-hmm. claims to have, like, a conversation for, like, a minute. Now, look, this is very different than a man like George Knapp who spent 25 years communicating and trying to get to the bottom of this. So, I, you know, I just kind of felt dissolute. That was a huge moment for me. That was like – I realized on stage – that what we were being told by an authority within the UFO world was based upon third-hand knowledge. He admitted on stage that he came up with that idea that Bob couldn't answer basic scientific questions because, you know, he heard from somebody that when they were running a radio show that there was a scientist kind of hidden on the telephone listening And that person on the radio asked afterwards to that scientist person, is he a real scientist? And that person said, "Uh, let me just say he's not going to have his day job tomorrow. I mean, just look at the look at the debate or whatever you want to call it. It was a huge moment. I just realized it's all hearsay. You know, look, bottom line is believe Bob or don't believe Bob. I don't think he cares. What's more important is what did he say? And can we entertain the idea, possibly the outlandish idea, that Bob is telling us the truth? So, so, so I hear you. I yeah. hear what you're saying. Well, what I said is this, you know, very similar because it's like either I was told that at a conference or something, but I don't. You know, I looked before this show tonight. I looked online to see if I could find anything about that, and I found nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, let, let, let's get to the, the crux of the matter, like like with, with Stan, okay? Um, I, I am not actively trying to figure out if Bob went to MIT. I actually don't care what girl he dated. I don't care what kind of cereal he likes. I want to know, did Bob Lazar work at or at somewhere near Area 51 at a sub-base called S4, back engineering, alien spacecraft or attempting to that's what i want to know so the first question i need to do is i need to figure out did he work at los alamos that could be a beginning to that if he worked at los alamos in a scientific capacity as a physicist it then makes sense to me that he could possibly be cherry-picked to work on some project out on the nellis air force base i mean that, to me, has always been key. So if I can prove that, if I can say, yes, he worked at Los Alamos in a scientific capacity as a physicist, then from there I can move forward. Other stuff, like, <laughs> whatever. I mean, go ahead and find out what cereal he likes or where he went to school. I don't know if it's true. There's no way for me to to, to, to prove that. Um what I can, what, what I'm hoping to prove is that he worked at Los Alamos, and it would be great to prove if he worked in some capacity through Nellis. Mm-hmm. My, my brother-in-law worked at Los Alamos for years, and my sister really? and brother-in-law lived there forever. And, um, in the we, 80s? In the 80s, yep. And I was wow. there back, um, I was back in Los Alamos visiting lived with them for almost a year, like in 78, 79, something like that. Oh, wow. Anyway, um, so I said to uh, my my brother-in-law, who loves cars and everything, I said, hey, did you hear about this jet car? And I figured for sure he would know about a jet car in Los Alamos. It's not a huge town. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he, he didn't know about it. But but you can find there are newspaper clippings. Oh, I mean, yeah. G- yeah. Give me a break, man. The, okay, the Los Alamos Monitor. Okay, here's right. an internal magazine for the scientists that live there. As you said, it's a small community. So you got the Monitor, the Lo- Los Alamos Monitor. Front page is Bob Lazar identified as a physicist at Los Alamos with his jet car. You know, look, I've talked to a number of people that knew Bob from Los Alamos. Now they won't go on the record because that because they want to stay employed. I won't I won't say that they all won't go on the record because the, I do have an announcement coming up in, in June on Coast. But 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 I will say that the majority of people won't go on the record. But what do we have? We have front page of Los Alamos Monitor. Bob Lazar identified as a physicist with a picture of him and his jet car. We have a phone book that George Knapp found, right? Right. And the phone book lists 
Robert Lazar. Now, Stan likes to make this huge deal that it has KM after his name, Kirk Meyer. So, oh, he could have been a janitor hired by Kirk Meyer to, you know, work at Los Alamos. Do you know how ridiculous that is? Every, I mean, almost everybody that works at Los Alamos, as you probably know, with, with, with your brother, is a subcontractor. I have met dozens and dozens of subcontractors for, uh, from Los Alamos. So this whole idea of separating, you know, Lazar because he was, you know, hired by Kurt Meyer is absolutely sleight of hand ridiculous. Hmm. Well, you know, it's, it's one of these things. Um, I remember having a conversation maybe four years ago with someone that's not really in the UFO field or, you know, they have a curiosity of it. And uh, Bob Lazar's name came up and we were talking about it. And, and I said, well, you know, no one can find any, you know, academic records or, um, you know, there's a lot of puzzling things. And, and he yeah, said, right. and he basically said to me, well, how do you know it wasn't all wiped out when he started talking? You know what hmm. I mean? So even people like on the outside of the UFO field are curious as uh, wondering if something like that may have happened. I can't I'm, say either way. Yeah, I mean, look, look, you can't just go, go ahead. I've done it. Go ahead and just, like, call up Los Alamos. <laughs> Ask them who they employ. Go, go, go ahead, and good luck. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's not it's, – it doesn't work like that. And, um, you know, I have no claim in, in here, like, you know, that I know he did this or that. I, I'm just as puzzled by you at certain things. It's just that – I'm looking to keep my eye on the prize. If I can find a colleague, if I can prove in some way that other people saw Bob at Los Alamos during that time, I mean, that's what I'm looking to do. Because, you know, I have talked to a number of people who have worked with him there at that time, but they're not willing to go on the record. Now, most most are not. Um, by the way, the listener out there, the live listener, you can call in the show if you'd like. And I'm facing three different computers. Sometimes I didn't catch a call the other night until it was too late. It is 603-967-4030 if you'd like to call in. We also have a message board, and um, I just saw a, a message up there. I mean, a question up there for you. Um, but, uh, oh, yes, I know what it was. Uh, Bob Lazar worked at S4 for, wasn't it, didn't he claim it was only for a couple of weeks? Yeah, it was it was a short amount of time. Okay, so I mean, I, I don't know if your listeners understand that the basics of the story, but you know, look, when he was hired to go out there, there was a, a period of time when he was getting you know confirmed through all of his security clearances, and I'll just say allegedly for the whole thing, like this, you know, you believe what you want to believe. You know, I've had personal confirmation at the highest possible level. I no longer have the luxury of disbelief, but you, the listener. As Bob would say, under the scientific method, you are obligated not to believe him because he cannot, you know, produce evidence uh, that you require. But uh, I personally, let's let's pretend that I have had evidence. Okay, uh, Bob worked out there for a short amount of time. Uh, during that time, as he described at the 2015 International UFO Conference, right, or Congress, um, he described that when he worked out there, he, it was a, a process of him getting his proper, uh, you know, certifications or um, you know, security clearances. And during that time, they'd bring him out, you know, moment by moment. He never really knew. They'd bring him out. He'd be read into this or that. And he'd start working in little bits of capacity. But then he admitted on stage there were personal problems in his life that, that, that caused him to be uh, what they would consider unstable. And uh, he said on stage his wife was uh, cheating on him. Hmm. <laughs> and uh, it was actually the 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 people uh, you know at, at, at the base that were kind of handling him that, that said, hey, your house is not in order. We've been tapping your phone, and we heard about the flight instructor, and you got to – uh, get your house in order. That's the first time he had ever heard about it. Poor guy. Did, you know, they actually said they were tapping his phone. And that's what he claimed. It, it, I'm. It's. It's more than that's what he claimed. Uh, if. If you really get into the story with with George Knapp, 
um, and with John Lear and with Bob Lazar and Gene Huff, uh, it's undeniable at the time they were listening. They wanted to make sure that his life was stable. Even George Knapp had a number of uh, people that came forward after the Lazar story, uh, six of them specifically, that were going to give him more information and were threatened and backed out. So, yes, their phones were tapped. And yes, they were being followed. And yes, they were told by the people who were following them. Later, George Knapp actually met a couple of them. Uh, so they were under surveillance. And, you know, look, it was a weird time. They all say that. And, um, yeah, that's what happened is essentially they were listening in. He had to sign something that said basically everything, you know, that you do is under scrutiny. And uh, they found out about the affair and told him before he knew it's really sad he admitted that i'm not talking out of school he admitted that on stage if you just watch his lecture from the uh 2015 international ufo congress yeah i'm gonna have to get alejandro to send me that oh you gotta watch it man it's it's epic bob lazar with his black suit and red sneakers i mean come on <laughs> <laughs> guy's got style you know uh, yeah i think uh i think he's his looks have actually improved with age you know, you he know, looks like a real cool gentleman now. You know, you know, I, you know, he he's a conundrum. I don't claim to, you know, to be to be his uh, BFF or anything. That would be Gene Huff. Um, but but I'd say, uh, look, if for what it's worth, which probably for most people not that much, um, I believe Bob. You know, I've I've spent time enough on this case, and I, I've I've had enough face time, and, and and been you know I've been in rooms where between him and John Lear and George Knapp and Gene Huff and, and Bob Lazar, you know, one person didn't know that I was in the room, let's say, and they were talking over the phone, and I could hear it on speaker, like, these guys are not lying. What they claim happened to them happened to them. You know, whether your mind can accept that or not as the listener, uh, that's on you. But for what it's worth, you know, um, I believe Bob. Well, you know, I... I understand that because when you're in like for instance i've i've been face to face with travis walton many times and um also uh jim uh, uh wiener and i don't know if you know, heard of the allagash um incident but yeah. also uh charlie uh Fultz. uh i've talked to these people face to face and you know I, i'm completely hook line and sinker i believe their stories you know, Look, and I think you have okay. to, you, if you're facing someone, you're talking to them, and, I mean, you have to know if that person's telling the truth. I, I really believe that. Yeah, I mean, look, you, you do your best. I mean, you know, the, the, the whole thing, I, I do all my interviews in person. I vet people to the core. You know, I, you know for example, just to, to, to give you an example, there's a couple whistleblowers that have come to me, alleged whistleblowers. And, you know, one of them, uh, I just straight up didn't believe. So I spent an entire weekend, you know, doing this filming with a prominent investigator, you know, putting them on film. I never let a, a, a frame of that footage, you know, come to light because, frankly, I just didn't believe him. And it's no big secret. Mm -hmm. I told Alejandro on stage, um, you know, who it was. But the, the, the point is, is that, you know, as an investigator – and, if, you know, we're, I'm a self-proclaimed investigator. I just, like, basically, you know, I've, I've found myself in a position where I've, I've had great access and I've been, you know, my camera has been my passport into the mysteries of the universe. It's very exciting. But basically, you have to vet your sources. And if you think they're talking a whole bunch of BS, then it is your duty to not put that out into the world or to give them any, you know, energy that's going to help them, you know, sell their BS, you know, about disclosure or whatever it is that they're trying to sell you based on fear. It's your job not to help propagate that BS. And I agree. That's how, yeah. yeah, that's how I feel, man. Well, you know, I've had a few people on the show, like in the middle of the show, all of a sudden, I'm not feeling it. <laughs> yeah. and, and all I can do is, is you know, maybe question a question or two and then, you know, let the listener make up their own mind. But if you think my listeners are going to let you say what you just did and not say who that person is. Uh, <laughs> oh, my gosh. You're calling me out there. Okay, look, all, all I'm saying is this. I'm just saying that, 
you know, people need to use their rational mind. You know, do not, you know, do not support people that prey upon your fear. The the, the whole thing is, is that, you know, I personally believe, like, you know, that uh, my partner, Ruben Langdon, he was the unsung hero of the citizen hearing. Ruben Langdon was the reason, you know, as far as a, you know, production standpoint, that that all happened. And uh, as you probably know, like, so Ruben and I have been fighting to get really high quality edited versions of the citizen hearing testimony out to the public as best we can. It's been an uphill fight, and uh, but we've done it, man. We have done it. You know, if you go to citizenhearing.org, you will be able to see all of the testimony in HD with multiple cameras, and uh, it's done. It's beautiful. It took an army to get that done. You know, don't get me wrong. It, it took it took everybody to get that done. But but Ruben Langdon is the unsung hero, and we are proud to announce that you can go and watch the entire testimony now for a very reasonable price. And every dollar that comes into that, we haven't gotten paid in years. You know, <laughs> the whole point is that we're going to you know put out a documentary film about um, you know some of the primary investigators within this field. So that that's the bottom line. It, it doesn't matter about other people. It doesn't matter about you know what people think about disclosure. It, you know, acknowledgement is here, man. And and if you just listen to the testimony and you just watch the 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 40 hours or 30 hours whatever it is of testimony you will be influenced, and you will be better educated, and that's the point. So I, it's not about bad mouth in anybody. It's about getting information out there. I think I, I think it was just yesterday or the day before I got that email that the DVDs are ready. Isn't that right? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. They've been ready. Um, yeah. So the D, that's right. So the the actual physical DVDs we have a limited edition. We had to print those because that's kind of was our original campaign was that we were going to deliver these DVDs to people. And yes, absolutely, you can buy the physical DVDs online. But we also made it available streaming, which you know is really the future. Everybody can just watch it on their iPhone, watch it on their computer at their leisure. Um, but yes, we also do have physical copies that we can now mail out to people and um man i mean we're still in the red it was difficult to to do all this and uh i don't want to bore you with those details but but the success the success moment right now is that the average typical everyday person that is interested to learn more can hear testimony from astronauts people within the FAA, former military, former police, former intelligence, and you can hear them stand up in front of five congressional members or ex-congressional members and one senator, Senator Gravel, and you can hear their testimony under oath. I mean, it is a powerful thing. Um, the message board, there's a question. Are these the exact same DVDs that were sent to the, uh, you know, the congressional people recently? There these are 500 of them sent out, I believe, or something. These are actually um, way higher quality. Uh, those were a kind of rush job that mm. were that were actually. It, it, I had no hand in that. Neither did my uh, partner Ruben Langdon. That was unfortunate. Uh, we were so close to having these professionally edited uh, pieces done. So, oh. so what you will be receiving in these, uh, like online. Or and, and also we have in, in full Spanish translation, by the way. There's another whole set online. But what you will be receiving in these night sessions and in these testimonies are professionally edited, beautiful copies that, uh, again, the unsung hero, Ruben Langdon, uh, made sure were perfect. Wow. Now, I, in hour two, I want to talk a little bit about, I think it's called Patient 17. Yeah, that's the um, film, baby. Yeah, that coming up, but um, and that has Roger Lear. I got to see that uh, sneak preview of that out in Phoenix. But um, speaking of the name Lear, a whole different spelling. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have you met John? You've met John Lear, obviously. Oh man, have I met John Lear? Okay, so we're <laughs> we're we're not on the same page here. Okay, check it out. So how this all started for me, I told you, was kind of hearing you know the Lazar you know Lear nap. Okay. 
So the very first frame of film that I ever filmed as a filmmaker, I went out after three years trying to get a hold of John Lear. Finally, he called me back, and he's like, Jeremy, I hear you've been trying to get a hold of me. And I'm thinking, yeah, I've had intelligence officers. I've had you know, people call you from every. Why haven't you called me back? It was incredible. <laughs> so he's like, all right, come on over. So I come over to his house. And he, I mean, this was like five years ago or something. And I, I was like, I want to make a film on you, John. I, I want to hear what you have to say. I want proof of the, you know, extraterrestrial visitors, you know. And I, I sit down in his house and I look at him. And for three days, I mean, the dude was like, silent he'd look at me uh, it was like i was staring down the barrel of his cigar you know he would like he wouldn't even acknowledge me unless i asked a question if my question was stupid he'd just look at me like your question is stupid you know and it was like the most unnerving thing you know this guy like flew for the cia and like you know i kind of you know he had some wild theories, and I was a jujitsu fighter. I mean, I wasn't like super scared, but it was like you know intimidating. And I was, so basically, that was my intro into ufology. Is you know the the, the godfather of conspiracy, John Lear. So I, I'm happy to report that I love him like a grandfather. You know that we've become you know good friends on a good day. Sometimes he gets super pissed at me because he feels I don't agree with everything he agrees with but but i love the guy and um man has does he have some powerful theories and although i don't you know subscribe to all of them the things i have been able to to validate of what he has said um i mean wow what an incredible enlightening experience to know john lear i've been making a film on john lear called immaculate deception which is far beyond a film now uh, essentially, it is an archive of a man's aim and life. And, uh, you know, he's a pioneer. You know, he is a cowboy. He is a renegade. And I feel like I've captured that over these uh, maybe about five years now of filming. And um, I've decided instead of doing just a short, you know, instead of like a, a normal film, Immaculate mm -hmm. Deception. Um, I'm going to release a series of pieces on John because I find him to be one of the most intriguing humans <laughs> on the planet. Now, did I see something on YouTube that you filmed with him in his basement or something? You, you may. There's a little – things slip out here and there. But I've got <laughs> – I basically at the, at the UFO Congress when I gave a presentation just before – George Knapp and Bob, I did premiere for the first time ever the trailer or the teaser, I'd say, for the work that I've been doing with John Lear. Um, so that so a little bit of that has kind of snuck out onto the web, uh, but you will be seeing a lot more very soon. Okay. I had him on the show, oh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, and it was really funny because um, we set a time and everything, and... Um, I want to say it was it was a landmark birthday the day after that he was extremely hungover and <laughs> and he's like uh, he kept like stumbling and I think at the time I was doing some uh, I was doing the podcast only so I was able to edit and I kept telling him don't worry I'll edit it out I'll edit it out well, and, let, let, let's you know just to get clear John doesn't drink since the moment that I've known him about five years ago uh, he hasn't had a drop of alcohol so most likely what you were experiencing was that John has you know pain from time to time uh, John you know look when he was 16 years old he crashed an airplane uh, and broke mm. almost every bone in his body. Wow. I mean, he did. He was not supposed to survive. You know, he was saved somehow. So, you know, this man has been through more than you or I probably. He, he, he's got grit. We'll just put it that way. So sometimes with his health, you know, he's 100% there and he's on. Other times he's not. But what you experienced definitely was not alcohol. You know, okay. That, well, that was wrong for me to say that. But um, something he did tell me that he was up most of the night or something. He told me that he he was like exhausted. You know. Yeah. Well, pro probably he was researching. I mean, John is a very very active researcher. With every ounce that he has, he puts in. And and just one more time, kind of in John's defense, although. I do not agree again. 
with all of the things that, that, that he says just because I can't validate them. Um, but but what I will say is that, you know, he – I have been in his presence when people travel across the United States or further internationally just to have audience with him. And he has been privy to information that you or I will never be privy to. I mean, it's it's amazing. The people that just, like, show up on his doorstep and, and, and want oh, yeah. to tell I him, bet. oh, it's amazing. And I was able to film that over these years. And, and once in a while, you know, you kind of get a glimpse into the world he lives in. And, man, I mean, he's tireless. Wow. Uh, now, his father, Bill Lear, I guess it is, um, you know, yeah. the inventor of the Lear jet, um, do you ha- and this is a question I never asked him when I was talking to him, but do you happen to know if he had any thoughts on UFOs? Did you ever ask him that? Yeah, well, I've probably asked, you know, John Lear every question under the rainbow at this point. You know, I mean, I've spent many a night at his home trying to understand the man and his philosophies. So, yes, I have. Now, you know, Bill Lear, John's father, was the inventor of the Lear Jet, as we know. Um, You know, by the way, his company was uh, what is now known as Motorola because it was the 8-track stereo also that he invented. So, like... Yeah, so B- Bill Lear was an incredible guy. Now, John will admit that, you know, Bill, his father and himself, they, they, they didn't get along. You know, they didn't get along in a lot of ways. Uh, but that, that question of if Bill Lear had anything to do with ufology, well, it was late in John's life when he found out that, in fact, Bill was one of the primary contractors working on anti-gravity and that sort of stuff. So the, as the story goes, his father actually was in some way connected to the uh, you know, gravitational experimentation uh, within, within aerospace. Wow. Okay. Well, actually, that's it for the first hour. If you want to hang in, everyone, just hang in there, and we'll be right back with Hour 2. We're back with hour two, and uh, we're back here with Jeremy Corbell. And in hour two, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, well, the other films that you've done and uh, what you've got coming up. So do you want to just briefly go over what, what's happening? Yeah, that, that sounds great. Um, okay, so essentially, if you go to extraordinarybeliefs.com, You can see the three-minute-plus little teaser on that front page. And that teaser kind of shows you images and an idea of what the total investigative series is about. But if you look, you know, on the front page of the website as well, there are 12 individual film properties. So most of which are about UFOs uh, or in some way connected to ufology. Uh, they are all developing. Some of them are outright. You can watch them right now, like Lost Vegas. It was actually, interestingly enough and funny enough, it was my first meeting with John Lear. I sat in his home. I came to film him. I was all ready, and he he wouldn't let me turn on the camera. He was, he was like, vetting me, you know? Uh-huh. So, for example, Lost Vegas, you can watch right now. And... Um, So on Extraordinary Beliefs, there are 12 film properties currently that are all in different stages of development. Uh, The first one that I think you'll be able to see will will be Patient 17, and that was about Dr. Roger Lear. Different spelling, different person. He is, for those of you that don't know, uh, you know, the only individual on the planet who was removing alleged off-world implants. And uh, he was doing that right here out of California. 
And uh, that was a film that I was very reluctant to do, but I ended up following Patient 17, as we call him, uh, through his whole experience of childhood abductions into the final surgical removal of this anomalous material that was found in his leg that we had researched isotopically, broad-spectrum elemental analysis, everything. And that film... I'll hint that you sh- might be able to watch it at the end of the month if you listen in the radio. Uh, okay. We have some questions that came up on – I'm having a little trouble with the question um, question uh, message board right now. But um, so Roger Lear, you obviously got to meet him as well. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, we had him on the show um, shortly before he actually passed away. He seemed oh. like a real, a real nice gentleman. I'm glad you got him before he passed. You're a really, really special guy. Uh, okay. Um, are you familiar with Daryl Sims? Yes, I am. I met Daryl uh, at the 2015 International UFO Congress. Yeah. Uh, well, um, on the message board earlier, and I just can't seem to get to it, they were talking about someone that was going to take Roger Lear's uh, place as far as removing um, you mean a, f- f- a physical surgeon or yes. somebody that was going to kind of caretake the process? I think it was – I'm not really sure. Okay. Well, you know, as far as a physical surgeon, um, I – you know, look, there's so much disorganization, you know, the rights to the objects. I mean, gosh, it's been a pain in the butt just to be able to study, you know, the, the object itself. Um you know, honestly, who has custodianship of them? I'm a little confused myself mm. right now. But, but, but really, the, the big question you just asked is, are people who believe they have an off-world implant embedded in their body emitting frequency denser than bone that might be nanotechnology from another civilization, you know, is anybody going to take them seriously? And can they have it cut out of their body? Right. If, that's your, <laughs> if that's your question... Uh, You know, the answer to that is uh, contact me. And I do have a surgeon uh, who has agreed to to do this. It was my childhood friend's uh, father. So, you know, the the question is, can this research continue? Yes, it can. The great thing about Dr. Roger Lear was that he put people through a psychological examination, through a psychological test. He had them provide him with certain levels of evidence prior to removal, prior to him even saying, I'm going to cut the body. I mean, isn't that like the first oath of medicine is do no harm, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not not a doctor, but I assume it's something like that, right? So, yeah, so... Is it going to continue? I certainly hope so. Now, anybody is free to contact me through my website. And, you know, from there, if a claim is valid in any way, if I can prove it anyway, um, there are people that want to help. So I, I, I hope. You know, I hope that people do continue this research. I think it is important. I think, you know, John Mack, head of Harvard Psychiatry, and, you know, Bud Hopkins, both of whom are passed away now, would agree if they were here. This research is important. Mm-hmm. The, the, this is not fictitious. This is not a psychological problem. That something is going on and we should investigate. Sure. And I, I want to go into one of your films, Nano Man, in, in a minute. But before that, you brought up a really good point. As it stands right now, who has the custody of these implants that were extracted over, you know, what was it, 17 or 18 of them? Yeah, or you patients? know, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so pa- Patient 17, who was uh, the man that is featured in uh, my film, was the last implant removal uh, of Dr. Lear's uh, career. And uh, so there's 17. Now, at one time, I know that I was working with Steve Colburn, who was the custodian of these objects. And I know, I believe, he had them all. I found it very difficult in, you know, to, to study the sample from who I now consider a really good friend, patient 17. Uh, but we, we were able to get some basic analysis done on it. Uh, I... 
you know, kind of read some internet stuff. I have no idea, to be honest with you. Like, I think that patients own these things. Like, it is my feeling that if it came out of someone, if something came out of my body, I would say that was mine. Right. You know? But but the thing is, I don't know. And, and And honestly, after 17 removals, if you have not been able to definitively prove something, then is this the right path? You know, I don't know. But but what I do know is that it merits investigation. So w- all I can say is I encourage whoever has custodianship of these 17 alleged off-world implants that they just allow the scientific community to, to engage these implants or to engage these objects. Um, you know, I, I, I don't operate in mystery. I don't operate in secrecy. Put it on the table. If it has value, it does. If it doesn't, go home. Um, have you ever actually seen one of these objects really, really close? Did you were you able to examine when oh, you were absolutely. making that film? I absolutely. I was sitting right there when it got cut out. I watched it. You know, and I watched Doctor Lear put it in his hand, take it over, put it in some tissue sample, and uh, ship it off to the lab. I actually uh, made a point to pay for the broad spectrum elemental analysis and isotopic analysis of. Uh, you know, sample number 17, because I wanted to know for my friend what it was. Is this a piece of rebar or is this nanotechnology, you know, from from, from an off-world civilization? Like, um, so, yeah, I saw it up close. Um, and and what, how did the test results come out? Well, you got to watch the movie for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Look, man. I did watch the movie. Okay, so yeah, so so you know, and we'll just kind of we'll kind of keep it a little mysterious yeah, here. But that you know, I will say this: like uh, everything you're thinking and more is true. This is a complicated case. You know, you can have incredible results, but then you have to scrutinize those results. So so you know, I am still today. You know, the the ending of the film for me was frustrating. I'm still questioning what's going on. And and I hope to be able to have access to the sample again. And I hope to be able to go further with this. I mean, there is a part two. But we got to get people up to the level of part one. They need to, to, to purchase the film. Uh, or view the film somehow. Which I'm working on. I'm, I'm working on how to get this out. There will be this small window of opportunity at the end of June. But but essentially, I'm trying to get this into people's hands so that I can continue the research. Now, did Dr. Lear remove – I know he was a podiatrist, but did he remove all of these implants or did he work with another – Surgeon. Yeah, so I guess as a podiatrist, you're kind of limited to you know cutting the feet, right? So you know, essentially, you have to kind of outsource other <laughs> other scalpels, right, to cut into different parts of the body. Patient 17's uh, object was in his leg, and so that was Doctor Matriciano that actually you know cut it open hmm. uh but dr lear is there and you know he's the the expert on all of this and um you know that that was his uh his role so i think some he cut out and other ones he you know had dr matriciana do it you know look who's willing to do it if you pay him you know but i, I have another doctor who's willing to donate his time oh wow well wow. uh your friend you say is your friend and that's uh, patient 17 to me, you know, watching the movie in, in Phoenix, um, I thought he was a very believable type of uh, subject that uh, didn't seem at all like he would be someone that would talk about any type of abductions or anything. Oh, yeah. He's a, he's a straight up, very intelligent. Um, I mean, the man's six foot nine, and first of all, he ta- he's a wow. he's a giant. I mean, the guy is like, and he, you know, he he towers over me. I had to like change my camera angles just to get him <laughs> in the frame. But like, you know, he's a very intelligent, thoughtful human being. He is a very skilled contractor. Uh, I, I would even say artisan, like you know, the way that he does uh, construction, and he's very articulate. And he is the absolute 
contradiction to what you would think of or what I would think of when I, when I was thinking somebody that's telling me about an abduction. I had all these preconceived notions in my mind, to be honest with you. I did not want to do this movie. You know, Dr. Lear personally was like, Jeremy, you got to do this movie. And my friend Ruben Langdon, you know, really kind of, I was like, throw me in coach. You know, he, he put me in as a producer and I, I did not even want to do it. I told Dr. Lear, I said, look, if this is BS, I'm an, I'm a serious investigative filmmaker. I will out you if this is BS. Are you sure you want me to film this? And he says, if I, you know, I've been doing this for you know a quarter century. If if if, it, if there wasn't something to it, I wouldn't ask you to do it. And so I was convinced. And um, what really made me stick with this because really I was just thrown into like you know Doctor Lear wanted me to film the the surgery. Okay, make a little film on his surgeries. But it was meeting patient 17 that really kind of turned the tide for me. Um, just as you said, he is atypical. He, he, he's not what I expected. Uh, you know, I don't know what I expected, but, but he's intelligent, articulate, down to earth. Uh, you know, he, he, but at the same time, you can tell that he has been traumatized by experiences outside of his control. Now, I will also say that I don't think that he necessarily associated what was in his leg with his abductive experiences. Hmm. I believe that he... He had his abductive experiences. I mean, that is no doubt. Like, he will tell you straightforward, this is what I experienced. But it was kind of like intimated to him, hey, well, this thing in your leg, which, by the way, was emitting electromagnetic frequency, which is weird, uh, may have something to do with these missing time, you know, uh, abductive experiences where you're seeing these grays and this whole thing. So, yeah, he's, he's not the typical guy you'd imagine. I mean, he's very credible. He's not lying. I know the guy. Now, how did he know there was something in his leg? Well, you know, he had uh, x-rays. He, he had a lot of pain. Uh, and he was riding his motorcycle and... He's a motorcycle rider, a passionate motorcycle rider, and he had this all this pain in his leg. So he had it x-rayed. I mean, it was like 10, 11 years ago. And this object appeared in the x-ray, denser than bone, so it's metallic. And, uh, it, you know, it just, it was there. And the docs were like, when did you have surgery? And he's like, I didn't have surgery. <laughs> and they're like, well, something's left in your leg. And, and and so that kind of just sat in the back of his mind. And then, you know, he went to go to, uh, you know, do a construction job. And it was the, the watchers guys. Uh, and, and they basically, you know, asked him or he saw something on the screen or something like this. And, and, they, and they asked him and he mentioned the thing in his leg and his abductive experiences. And one thing led to the next and he met Dr. Lear. And it was kind of like he was led down this path. Now, we still, again, watch the movie, but it's fascinating. I don't know what to think. Right, right. Now, um, a uh, question up on the message board. Did you happen to know uh, as much detail to know what frequency, what frequency the modulation was? You know what? So I, I knew nothing. I, I'll say that I was completely naive and, and, and ignorant to the entire culture of this implant removal or implant, you know, phenomenon, uh, I, you know, this was not my field of research. I was finding individuals within the military or the government who, or, or, or intelligence agencies that would, that would speak out to me. That was my focus. So this whole thing was not really my, with, within the field or the scope of my expertise. Sure. Now, with that said, I was told a number of things. 
We've all heard the story that Dr. Lear claimed that it was at the 5 megahertz frequency and that this is the deep space frequency. And it sounds really nice. Now, I have no idea. I really have no idea. I saw a Gauss meter, which I guess measures electromagnetic frequency. Like, we brought it up to my camera. I have one now. It it, it just basically makes a sound. Okay, so you get electromagnetic frequency. You know, you bring this over the object, and it goes off. Okay, but I have no idea if this is truly a frequency from the object itself, as Dr. Lear claimed, or if it's ambient electromagnetic frequency. Again, it's not my specialty. Mm -hmm. The claim is also once you detach it from the body, it shuts off, you know, like as if the body powers it. Can I prove that? No. Am I trying to prove that? Definitely not. But but the, the, the basic idea is that there is some sort of energetic field that surrounds these things, like a beacon. Now, Dr. Lear claimed that these were most likely transmitting on a scalar wave frequency, which, again, to me, I don't really understand what that means, and maybe some of your listeners can enlighten me. But that what we're picking up, imagine it like this. You throw a rock into water and... That's the impact, but there's a ripple effect. And on the shore, you can pick up the fact that something was thrown in the water because you get little waves. So maybe what we're experiencing, kind of like gravity itself, maybe what we're experiencing is some sort of runoff from a greater frequency. And that is a reach. That is a stretch. I am theorizing right now. All I know is a, is a foreign object was removed from a man's leg This object was interrogated both with broad-spectrum elemental analysis and isotopic analysis to try to determine its non-terrestriality or terrestriality. You know, I cannot claim that I have any knowledge more about that. Uh Uh-huh. One of the questions that comes up uh, surprisingly is, um, do you happen to know what blood type patient 17 was? I have no idea, but that is something I will now ask. Yeah, find out if it's RH negative, if you would, if you want to make a note of that, because... Yeah, I will for sure. uh, It seems, you know, we have someone in the chat room that asks almost um, every time we have someone on that's involved in abductions in it, and over and over and over, it's almost like he's making his own scientific... Uh, work through the chat room. It yeah, seems well, like no, no, it makes sense. What 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 your writer is um, asking about is is a very popular theory, actually. So I'm I, I do have some understanding of why he's asking that question. Um, you know, there, there's a there's a wealth of information out there online if you want to research that. I will ask, um, and we'll find out that for sure. What, what I'm looking forward to is hopefully there'll be this, like, seven-day window at the end of June where you'll be able to view a pre-premiere, kind of like, hey, tell me what you think about the movie. What do you think about it? What can I make better? You know, what, what, what else would you like to know if I do a part two? That's what I'm planning to do. So these types of questions, like the RH negative, that'll be great. But what I'm going to be doing with the release of the film is also releasing the isotopic and elemental analysis. I'm putting it all out on the table, and I'm saying, hey, everybody, get on this. Tell me, is this anomalous or is this not? Because we are divided 50-50. I mean, certainly, some of the information, the data that came back, without giving it all away, I want you to watch the movie. This is how I make my living, I hope, right? But when you watch the movie, some of the data came back definitively anomalous. But what I want to know is, what is the margin of error? How can this be an error? You know, And I think there there, there are answers to that. You know, so so the que- you know, it comes down to I have no idea if we're ever going to prove this or not. But we, you know, we have a sample, we have some analysis. I want the world to tear it apart. Now, uh, when I had Ro- Roger on, I think I asked some some questions about what type of research has been done. Once these have been pulled out 
and uh, extracted is a better word for that, and um, tested. Do you happen to know if they put in some type of solution and just put away, or do you know how their storage yeah. is? Well, the storage is a different, uh, totally different matter, but like how I personally had object 17 analyzed it was a destructive test so i had it um you know the the object itself i worked with steve colburn who was holding the object at the time and i had him um send it directly to a laboratory it's a accredited great laboratory and they dissolve the part of the object and then from that they're able to determine a number of things. Again, broad spectrum, elemental analysis. This piece of metal had over 35 alloys. 35 elements. Wow. Yeah, it was complex. Now, uh, some were in very, very trace, trace amounts. I mean, the majority of it was iron. But... Uh, it's these tiny little trace amounts that I've been kind of investigating. And then isotopically, I was able to have two or pay for two different isotopes to, to, to be analyzed, uh, zinc and copper. The zinc was absolutely fascinating. The, the, the zinc isotopes were, were where I was really fascinated by the results. And again, it's kind of heady stuff. Like it was a huge learning curve for me. Look, I was a mixed martial athlete. I was a jujitsu fighter. I was, <laughs> I was not, I was not analyzing isotopes or elements in in college. <laughs> and, and then and then I was a fine artist, you know, and I was doing artwork. And uh, you know, so now it was a, it was a steep learning curve. But the the one thing that I did learn from martial arts was you know tenacity. It was the ability to you know fight for something until you get results. And so that really helped me. And so with the analysis, it was a destructive test, but not all of it. Just part of it. And we were able to determine precisely what 35 or 36 different elements were contained, even in trace amounts, within this object, object 17. And additionally, I had two elements that were analyzed. And look, I took these results to nanophysicists. I took these results to meteorite specialists, the head of the meteorite department at UCLA. I took these results to uh, scientists that worked on the original um, uh, nuclear tests uh, out at uh, out in Alamogordo. Um, I took these results to people that worked at Los Alamos. So. I've done the best I can, you know. Now it's kind of up to the public jury to figure out what to do next. I need your help. <laughs> uh, uh, um, so let's let's talk a little bit about uh, Nano Man because this is uh, sort of similar in a way. This is a a film you have coming out, or is it is it out well, already? Again, it's a huge series, and, and, and uh. if you go to extraordinarybeliefs dot com and, and you click on like the first, you know, of the 12 film properties you'll be able to see like a 31 second teaser and 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 a little audio clip um there are two imdb sites for it uh basically i have two shorts that are done one is called nanoman utility fog and the other one is about something that he calls the space drive uh, soon enough, I will release uh, Nanoman's identity. Uh, he is a military-funded nanophysicist who was developing uh, under the authority of the, the Navy, uh, funding from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, uh, a propulsion technology unlike anything that has been seen before. And it has promise it's 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 quite fascinating uh and his whole thing is upscaling it to marketability and that sort of thing the other film uh again a short is called utility fog and i'm opening with this june 25th or 26th it'll be available and i'm opening with this film because it shows you how a very serious scientific man kind of achieved some of his uh, greater accomplishments in life is because he was shown 
materials that modern-day nanotechnology simply cannot build. And one day, he handed me a vial which looked like water, and it was ethanol. And he said that inside this little vial of ethanol was nanotechnology that is a thousand years beyond what we have now. And I was totally skeptical. I was like, it looks like a bottle. It looks like a little vial of water. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And he's like, not only that, but this was collected at a uh, like like at a abduction site or a crop circle like you know it was UFO related and i was like come on man i'm like all right if you're so sure <laughs> you know man oh man if you're so sure then let me analyze it and he goes no problem and he hands it to me and he goes not only that but uh, you're going to need a scanning electron microscope to do that so let me just uh, get you into nasa as a visitor and uh, let you uh, have an unrestricted film access pass and see what you find. And I hope you find what I saw in this sample nine years ago. And sure enough, that's what my film is about. I take this vial of liquid and I take it to NASA Ames in NorCal, Northern California, and I have it analyzed for an entire day under a scanning electron microscope. And if you want to know the rest, you have to watch the movie, <laughs> <laughs> which will be released. I mean, it, it's not, you know, it, it will be out there as of the, you know, 25th or 26th of this month. Ah, wow. So you actually were able to go right in NASA and do this filming. I was actually shocked. I mean, I'm a dude with a beard and a bunch of tattoos, and you're going to let me walk in with a driver's license and get an unrestricted, right, no escort pass to film at NASA Ames? I mean, look, I'm a nice guy, and I'm grateful for it. I was just a little bit shocked. <laughs> and um, and fortunately, yeah, that that's what happened. I mean, you know, Nano Man as I call him now, uh, w w was able to set up through this really great technician who works on the, the, the electron microscope there. And it was actually through Foothill, Foothill College. They were the ones that uh, funded it. And they knew what I was looking for. They were like, you have an anomalous uh, alloy? We're excited to find out more as well if there's anything in there. So, yeah, unrestricted. I mean, the film is really cool. You see this um, technician just kind of like grab his head rock his face side to side like i don't know how to explain what we're seeing hmm. and it was cool it was cool i still i'm not any closer to to being able to prove anything but what i what i can say is there are anomalies and it's our duty to research them Right. Um, we have a question up that is totally unrelated, so we're going to be skipping around a little bit here and there. I love tangents. <laughs> during, <laughs> during a recent conversation with Stephen Bassett, he was on this show, wasn't that recent, but a few months ago, he stated that he was unaware um, of any of the congressional people that watched his DVDs that were mailed out. Um, do you know if that's changed since then? Oh gosh, I have no clue what what anything about that. That was not something that uh, my partner uh, Ruben Langdon or myself were involved with. Uh, you know th that, that was the is, early mail out. Yeah, yeah, the early mail out. I you know honestly that is not uh, within the scope of my um, responsibilities. My responsibility is to the you know, f original funding members of our campaign to make a documentary. So my responsibility is really to make sure that the citizen hearing was edited and perfectly created uh, with Ruben Langdon so that the people could get this information and move that tide forward. Uh, you know, just openly speaking, uh, Anything else is is really to me, um, you know, if I were to spend my time on it, it's a fool's errand. What, what I'm trying to do is get the information out to the people through these perfectly edited uh, DVD sets and also just online uh, VODs. And then from there, you know, the people can champion uh, the rest of it. 
So I have no knowledge and, and really not that much interest in, in the rest of that. I'm just trying to get it out to the people. Mm-hmm. Now, what are you thinking in your own mind? Do you have like a plan of, say, UFO-related films that you want to attack and try in the future? Do you have a general plan? or And along those lines, what do you think of some of the old cases? Are those, are those just too far in the past to really do investigative uh, filming on? Um, oh, absolutely not. Like, they, you know, I, I you know, look, the, the older cases uh, might be of extremely high value. I, I, I wouldn't, you know, count them out in, in, in any way. Um, there, there's always something, there's always a rock that hasn't been turned over. You know, if, if you are curious enough, you will be driven and it takes an army. It's like one individual is not going to do it, right? It takes an army. So um, the best kind of leads that I've ever gotten are from my viewers. You know, it's from people who write to me through ExtraordinaryBeliefs.com. Like it's people who send me, you know, certain tips, you know. And if I can kind of get my hooks in them, if there's any substance to them, th- then great. So so for me, what, what I'm looking to do is uh, I have about six years of content, I'd say, that is is really ready to go. So, so hopefully you'll be seeing a lot more of it. I mean, I spent a number of days with Dr. Edgar Mitchell out at his home in Florida. We talked all about his ideas of uh, the cover-up, as he talks about it, of our planet being engaged by non-humans. Um, I've got a film called The, the Summoner. And it's about an ex, uh, an ex homeless, ex heroin addict. This beautiful, amazing individual whose whole life turned around the moment that he realized, and I'll say realized rather than believed, because for him it's very true um, that he could summon, in quotes, UFOs. And um, I'm doing a piece on cold fusion because that would be part of the technology or the energy source that's used for these craft. Um, the anonymous interview you might know about, who is the whistleblower up in um, oh yeah North America. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of films that I'm working on right now. I have a I have a really good subject for you, and yeah, we can Love talk. I guess I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit on air because it'd be kind of unfair me, for me to say that. But actually, um, he's been on the show a number of times, and I've gotten to be uh, pretty close friends with him. He's an old-time researcher, uh, Ray Stanford. Um, are you familiar with him? He did. He was a. Uh, he wrote a book about the Socorro incident, um, but he is a fascinating, fascinating man. Incident. And yeah. not only that, he has some unbelievable films. I've talked to many people that have visited him and are absolutely blown away with some of the things he has. And uh, so I'm going to uh, try to connect you two together. That'd be great. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the you know, the Lonnie Zamora incident, as they say. I mean, amazing. That case was absolutely amazing. Um, you know, I recently learned that... Uh, you know, within the investigations by Project Blue Book, that they actually hid the 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 the, the, the true symbol that was on yeah. the side of the craft. Well, I'll so tell you. Could, I'll yeah. tell you right now that I just tonight I just got an email from Ray that he is displaying what the real insignia was. He just sent that to me. Really? Mm-hmm. I would love to, to hear what he has to say. But yeah, so that's amazing. So he's a he's an interesting guy that you would uh, you know say, hey, has gone deep and, and vouch for him, then hey, send him my way. Anybody can email me. I mean, it's not that hard. I'll get the email. You know, just send an email. Yeah, yeah. But uh, Ray has told me now that I was actually heading down and I had a business deal come up, but I couldn't go. But he told me that he wants two days of your time just to talk to you and show you what he has before you make, before you do anything. He wants, he wants that. Me me personally? Uh, Anyone who's interested in really looking into what he has um, needs to be able to have two days with him. 
Well, whatever he has better be able to time shift and give me those two days back if I can't do anything with it. But <laughs> but, but I'm feeling but I'm feeling you. Um, I mean, look, anybody that can't tell me something in two minutes and, and get me engaged, uh, I I don't know what to say. Like you know, I am I am in. I've spent years years on cases, but you know what? I, within two minutes, you can give me the basics. If if I can do anything for you, then you should be able to just tell me straight up. But from that, I mean, look, I, every case I'm working on at this current moment, all 12 properties that you see on Extraordinary Beliefs, I, I've spent years on, you know, I am not a soundbite investigative journalist. I get deep. I try to find out the truth. And even if I've spent time, and I'm talking about like a year of my time, and it turns out that at the end, I just don't buy it. I don't give it any energy. I don't give it any popularity. Mm-hmm. So, so, but listen, your, your buddy, Ray, like I'd love to meet him. Love to hear what he has to say. If there's substance to it, then we'll go from there. All right, I will. Uh, I'll have them get in touch with you, or or set something up. But um, so one of the the things that comes to mind is, uh, are you getting funding for these shows, or do you do Kickstart or anything like that? No, I, you know, I kind of re- refuse to do that. Like everything is 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 done, you know, just self funded. And, uh, you know, th- there are limitations to that. I mean, this is what I've dedicated 100% of my time to. Uh, you know, luckily from my jujitsu past and this sort of thing, you know, um, I-, I was able to own a property or two and that- that's helping me. But, I mean, it's, it's-, it's come to – it's the come to Jesus moment here, you know, <laughs> as they say. Like, you know, I need to start putting my work out. And if I've done a good job – then people will start buying my work. You know, it's kind of like the citizen hearing. I don't believe in fundraising. You know, just we have a great product. Go rent it. If you rent it or buy it, then we will be able to continue our work. Same thing with ExtraordinaryBeliefs.com. If you go there and you like my work, rent it. That goes to me, and then I'll be able to continue my work. I am not funded by some billionaire. I am not like, you know, <laughs> this is all on me, man. And and I have to make the choices. Uh, so that's why I have to be discriminatory when it comes to what leads that I follow. But I will take any claim seriously until I just can't. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll tell you one film that I'm excited to see is the, uh, the John Lear you know, because yeah. he is uh, a fascinating man. He really is. I mean, some people say he's not so whatever, but he's still very uh, highly intelligent. And uh, I mean, how many planes did that guy fly? He okay, can well, fly anything, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, undoubtedly, he is, uh, you know, b- borderline genius, right? And that he will also, uh, you know, <laughs> He will also entertain that you think he's crazy. Like he does not, you know, he has no qualms with that. He knows what he knows and he doesn't give uh, whatever if you care or if you believe him. But he is one of the most fascinating people that I know. And he has an incredible range of theories and beliefs. He is an accredited pilot, you know, every FAA certificate. You know, he did fly as a subcontractor like Lazar at Los Alamos, okay? He did fly for the CIA back in the 70s. Uh, But more than that, the guy's just a pioneer and an explorer and an open-minded individual, and he is fascinating. Everything about him is fascinating. He dug so deep into ufology. The only reason we know ufology like we do today is because of John Lear. He came forward. Look, remember... The, the reason why he had any play at all with the news station back in the day with George's mentor, Ned Day, right, who was this incredible journalist who, who kind of like, you know, helped George uh, along the way, uh, is because he brought into the, the news station pictures of the stealth fighter before it was acknowledged by the United States government. I mean, here's a guy who would sit outside of Area 51 snapping photos. I'll tell you a little funny story about John Lear. So there he is, and he's probably hanging out with Jim Goodall or something like that. And and they're looking for planes, you know. And John rolls up to Area 51 in his pickup, 
and he busts out his camera. And at the time, there's there's literally a chain link fence, right? They're, they're not even a chain link. I'm sorry. There's a hanging chain on the dry lake bed. Okay, that was the security. This was 1977. Yeah, and he takes this. He he takes his camera and he does from left to right. Snap, 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 snap. And he takes this panoramic view of Area 51 from the ground level. You have never seen a photo like this, okay? And then he takes it, and he pulls out of his camera the film, and he puts it under the ashtray of his car because he sees, like, cars, you know, coming across the desert at him. (laughs) He pops in another roll of film, does the exact same set of shots, and by the time the car pulls up to them, what are you doing here? You can't be here. And he says, well, this is BLM land. I'm on this side of the chain. And they're like, well, you can. We're confiscating everything you got. And he goes, well, let me just give you my film. And he pulls out of the camera the film and he hands it to him. <laughs> okay, well, they didn't ask if he had any in the ashtray. Okay. <laughs> so, anyway, so this story came out. You know, uh, George Knapp has used these before. I mean, they're public images now. So I'm not like, you know, I, I have – the original negatives and I have the, the original film and I scan them all to make sure they're, you know, completely uh, documented for all history. But they are the most incredible shots of Area 51 I've ever seen because they are from the perspective of the lake bed with literally a chain that just hangs across the front of the frame. Wow. It's amazing. Wow. So John Lear is just an epic individual, and I cannot wait to start releasing that footage. And uh, again, I'm one person. You know, I'm not like a huge production company. It's just me, and <laughs> I'm trying to survive. So these films have to come out one at a time, and I hope that they fund my further research. Now, when I spoke to John, uh, I had mentioned that I was going to be interviewing him the week before my podcast came out, and someone posed a question for me to ask him. It was about a letter that was hoaxed by him and someone else, and the the question was, did he actually write that letter? And it wasn't hoaxed. People are so crazy. Okay. That was the Krill letter, right? The Krill letter. Right. Uh, that they they created it, or so, he created it with someone else yeah, or something. Yeah, pe- man, people are just – it's just – Unless I'm wrong, it's just people are just disinformed. I mean, man, what John was doing with that letter, as I understand it, and again, I am open to being completely wrong, and John would be the guy to ask, not me, okay? But from the way I understand it was he was writing an assessment. He was trying to explain what you know, what his uh, idea is at the time, what the general – concept of ufology was and and somehow that got turned into he was hoaxing letters Uh, you know john john couldn't hoax anything man you know he's he's transparent you know i don't i make a joke but it's like you know these guys couldn't keep a secret if their life depended on it you know i mean it's just you know i've spent time with him He, he he's not trying to hoax people life is too exciting and fascinating in and of itself. There's too many mysteries to waste your time hoaxing people. So the the best answer I have for that was people misinterpreted the whole point of what he wrote. But yeah, he wrote the the Krill letter. That was his big argument uh, with William Cooper. You know, William Cooper claimed, because he was a total charlatan and con man, William Cooper claimed that he read the Krill letters when he was in the Navy. BS. Lear pulled him aside and said, how can you say that? I wrote that. Everybody knows that. So, you know, if anything, that was a misunderstanding. But again, you should ask the man himself and not me because I might be misinformed. Yeah, I did. I did ask him. It's just I can't I can't remember how I asked him or how he answered the question, actually. But he did. He was honest. I, I know whatever it was, he was. He was honest. I was just looking now. That was back in December 2012 when I um, interviewed him about. And yeah, he, he's he's al- he's always honest. I mean, that's the thing about John is a, uh, you know, he's a, a no, no BS dude. You know, it, now you might not agree with anything he says, but but he's not trying to hoax you. Yeah, and that was uh, I see in the notes here. It was the day after his 70th birthday. 
<laughs> oh, yeah, I was there. That was amazing. We had a bash, man. We had a great bash. We were there. That was actually a very special day because, man, people came out of the woodwork for that to, to kind of honor John. And at his house, it was a big party, and I filmed the whole thing. And the interviews I got that night, man, the, the people that came from Lockheed Skunk Works, from uh, just you know aviation people that were just in awe of what he had achieved. He's one of only two people in the world that got to fly under the, the Golden Gate Bridge. It happened to be because his wow. plane was about to crash. But um, – <laughs> He had like 16 world speed records in the Learjet. I mean, people come just for aviation itself. You know, I was there and the, one of the head instructors at Nellis Air Force Base, you know, just because John asked him to, came and buzzed the house. I mean, the windows were shaking. This plane came right over the house. Wow. It was wild. And then the other thing about John, I just want to throw this out there for you. If you go look at the trailer for Immaculate Deception, you will hear audio. That audio, which are radio calls, 515, Dreamland, Dreamland, those are actual recordings. The only ones that I know of from Area 51 <laughs> that John took way back in the day that are now public record. <laughs> well, he, he did tell me about the story about when he went out. I, I think it was him. Yeah, he went out with Bob Lazar, right, to uh, look for UFOs over Area 51. Well, very specifically, Bob Lazar, at a time when he thought he was not going to be called back into work and probably was a little bit pissed about it because of his personal troubles, right, uh, ended up starting to take people out there. And I think John, uh, you know, had a, the best telescope in town, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so uh, somehow uh, they all went out there and on a number of occasions, I think, and um, – and, uh, yeah, and they were out there, and, you know, Gene Huff uh, in particular uh, with Bob, you know, they uh, – and John as well, you know, they they saw a disc over Papoose Lake, a flying saucer, glowing orange, so much so they had to kind of dive behind a car because they thought it was going to explode right at the exact time and the exact place – that Lazar told them it would be there. Right. And again, that's something that people just kind of bypass. Like that evidence just doesn't sit within their theory that Bob is a con man and a fraud, which is a ridiculous personal attack, Phil Class style, that you would even say about somebody. You know, go to the evidence. Go to the story. Go to what people say. Don't make assaults against their character. But anyway, that's something that's an inconvenient truth for people that want to just debunk, you know, anything Lazar ever said. He knew the time and the place that a disc that looked like a flying saucer, glowing orange, making extreme maneuvers would rise up out of a sub base that apparently nobody knew about at the time called S4 at Papoose Dry Lake. Explain that. Right. And um, I think Lear said that by accident he kicked the tripod. <laughs> when he's... That's like super, super Lear style, right? I mean, whatever. It's a tripod. It's not a camera. So whatever. Yeah. But, yeah, he, he had a perfect, perfect sight of it, you know, through, through the tri through the you know, telescope. And then his buddy wanted to see it who will remain unnamed, but his buddy wanted to see it. And, you know, right as he's going to show him, he like his ankle gets caught on the tripod and, you know, you move those things a millimeter oh, and you're yeah. not able it's to. All done. So, yeah. so Lear had a close up, uh, you know, visual on it apparently, but um, yeah, they saw it on multiple occasions. I mean, there was a test flight that was regular that somehow this guy who people would like to pretend didn't have any access to, to the Nellis Air Force Base just knew it would be flying. You know, it's incredible. An inconvenient truth. Oh, someone was asking. No. Uh, okay. I guess they were asking me, um, asking me a question uh, separately. Sorry about that. Um, no and we have about seven minutes left. And one of the things – uh, actually, it's only three minutes to wrap up. Um, I was wondering, have you uh, are you reaching out to anyone or trying to reach out to someone? I know you mentioned before that um, it was uh, it took quite a while to get Roger. I mean, I'm sorry for John to take you seriously. Are there other people you've been trying to get a hold of um, that you're having difficulty? 
You know, um, at this moment, I would say no. There's nobody that I'm trying to get a hold of that I'm having difficulty. Uh, what I would say is that currently – I'm the best information that I'm getting is from people who are within the United States military in any of the branches that want to come forward and they want to tell the story either off the record or on the record and they can either be active or not active but that is what I'm truly interested in because you know there is a stranglehold on the physics of the universe by these sub factions of the United States military so all I'd like to say is reach out to me if you have something that you want to tell me, just email me, editor at extraordinarybeliefs.com. That will get to me. Um, you are my first line of defense is, uh, you know, or offense, you know, learning what's going on. You, the listener. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are one of the things I, I'm always puzzled at, like, for instance, the O'Hare incident back in Chicago so Amazing. many years ago with all those witnesses that clammed up and went away. And I always think, well, yeah. they probably all, not all of them kept their job. And, you know, why wouldn't they talk now? And that's, to me, I'm hoping that someone will come forward on that particular case. That would be great. Go investigate each of those witnesses. I mean, you know, look, with a little more funding, I would be on that like you wouldn't believe, you know. But, uh, you know, one day at a time here, I'm just putting out some of the stuff that I already have. That is a fascinating case, a very fascinating case. That's right. Well, one more time, uh, you can find out more about uh, Jeremy at uh, ExtraordinaryBeliefs.com. Did I say that right? Absolutely. ExtraordinaryBeliefs.com. And Jeremy, I got to say, it's been a a real, real pleasure talking. It's with been you it's tonight. been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on I, again. Like everything I'm doing, extraordinary beliefs. It, it's like the modern day Twilight Zone, except everything is absolutely real. Myth, illusion, and scientific fact kind of merge into one, and, and it's a unique portrait of the UFO reality. So please go check it out and be communicative. You know, become part of the investigation, not just an observer. Right. And the one thing I re really enjoyed about you the most is when you, when you call BS, you don't go forward with it. I really like that a lot. Well, thanks again. That's it tonight for the show, everyone. If you want to check us out next week, we'll be here live on the Dark Matter Radio Network right here at 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time on Wednesday. I want to thank some people for helping out with the show, Alejandro Rojas. Uh, for, with the news, our guest, of course, Jeremy Corbell. Uh, Peggy Shunning for managing the Facebook page. Remember to like us on Facebook for all the latest UFO news, and we'll see you here next week. And thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks for listening, and remember, keep your eyes to the sky.